All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, welcome to the Teach Wild Science for Schools webinar. Um, my name is Geraldine Davis and I work with Earthwatch Australia. Um, as many of you know, schools from across Australia have been assisting scientists uh, from CSIRO in the collection of data on marine debris. And today uh, we're going to hear more about their current research. Um, Chris Wilcox was going to speak today about the program, but um, he's unavailable. So another member of the research team, TJ Lawson, will actually outline the team's current research. Um, so just a reminder to everyone out there, students in particular, if you've got any questions for TJ, um, just type them in and we're going to try and get through as many questions as possible um, at the end of the webinar. A um, big thanks to all the students who have already typed in questions or emailed them through to us. And um, yeah, we'll actually have a chance to go through as many of those as we can. Um, so I'd like to pass over now to TJ and she's going to talk more about their current research and some of the initial outcomes from the program. Hi everyone. As Geraldine said, I'm TJ. And yes, if you're looking at my photo, that is a real possum on my shoulder has nothing to do with marine debris, which I'm going to talk to you about today, but he was a cute little guy anyway. So I work with CSIRO on the Marine Debris Project, um, which is led by Denise Hardesty. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what we've done and what we've found. Um, and if you guys have got questions, type them in and hopefully we can get to them at the end. So on this, our project goal was to really look at what threat marine debris poses to our wildlife. But before we can actually look at the threat marine debris poses, we need to know what is actually out there. So we all know we have marine debris in Australia. We've all seen stuff on our beaches. But what is it? When you have really have a look at is it, what is it? Um, and to look at what threat the debris poses to wildlife, we've looked at seabirds. But we need to know, do these seabirds occur in areas where the marine debris occurs? Or you know, do, do they occur in different areas? So we've looked at where the birds live and where the birds breed and where the marine debris is. And we want to find out what happens to those birds if they live in an area where there is marine debris. You know, do they eat it? Do they get caught up in it? These are some of the questions that we wanted to find out. So first off, we wanted to know what's, what's actually on our beaches? You know, where does it come from? How does it get there? And these are some of the questions we've had um, emailed in from um, some of the students. So hopefully I can answer these as we go through this presentation. We also want to know, is what's on our beaches the same as what's in our oceans? Or are they different? And where did, finally, where does it go? What happens to the marine debris? Does it go away? Does it stay there? What happens to it? So hopefully these are some of the questions I'll answer during this presentation. So to answer the question, what's out there, we had to go out and find out what's out there. So my job was to go out onto beaches and we surveyed over a hundred beaches and looked and actually picked up every piece of rubbish we found and wrote down what is it? Is it plastic? Is it glass? Is it paper? Is it metal? And what colour is it? Is it blue? Is it black? Is it green? Is it white? And the reason we ask this is so we can tie this back to the wildlife later. Like, do the wildlife only, do the seabirds only eat a certain type of plastic? You know, and if so, why? But we needed to collect all that information at the beginning. But to go and do all these coastal surveys around the country, we had we had to do it by a lot of different methods. In some areas we had to get in a boat and go over to an island so we could do the survey. 
In other areas between Broome and Darwin, we had to do it by float plane. So we went up in the plane and then we came down and landed on a beach and then went up again. And in other areas, we could get there by car. And in some areas, we had to park the car and walk three or four kilometres into the beach, hiking to the beach. So there was a variety of ways we surveyed our sites. And you can see now I've got a map up on the screen of Australia. And all those little blue dots are where we've surveyed beaches. So there's over 180 beaches we've surveyed there. We also did to find out, to answer the question, is what's out in the water the same as what's on our beaches? We had to go out and find out what's in the water. Like we've done the surveys to find out what's on the beaches. And but like we have to go do surveys to find out what's actually out in the water. So we ran a number of what we call at sea surveys and these were done on a boat called the Southern Surveyor. And you can see the little map in there of all the different uh, routes that were taken. And some of the teachers went um, from Perth up to Darwin and we had other people going around and doing these sea voyages. So we could find out exactly what was in the sea. Because Australia is so big and we couldn't get to all the beaches, so we surveyed beaches every 100 kilometres. So there was 100 kilometres between survey points. That's quite a big gap. Um, and we can't, you know, we can't go back and survey every 10 kilometres. So what we did is we went out and talked as kids, and probably some of you who are online today, we may have talked to you. Um, and we took, you, took school kids out to the beach and showed them how to do our transects and got them to collect information for us. And so, and you know, we've taken over 4,000 kids out onto the beach and spoken to an additional 50 classes. So that's a lot. And so we, these citizen scientists have actually filled in some um, knowledge gaps for us. So where we couldn't get to to survey the beaches, they've gone out and done that for us. And that's been excellent. We've also had 10 week-long trips where we take out some of your teachers and we take them out into different areas and we've been to North Stradbroke Island in Queensland and Phillip Island in Victoria and Rottnest Island in Western Australia. And we've also done taken a group out on the Southern Surveyor, which I mentioned earlier was the big ship owned by CSIRO. And what we do with them, we take them out and they do some coastal debris surveys, the same as we did. They do some surface trawls the same as what was done on the boats to look at what plastics are in the water. They did some seabird colony transects, so to see if the seabirds, if they had been eating plastic, were they bringing it back to their nests? And they looked at where we found dead birds and dead turtles. They cut them open and they had a look and to see if there were any plastics inside them. They also did decay rate experiments with turtles and fish and to see how long they would last in the marine environment. Um, this is helpful for us to figure out how many animals are likely to be killed in um, fishing gear that washes up on our shores. So when, you know, if a net gets, a fishing net gets caught up, um, sometimes the people on the boat just cut it off and then it floats around in the water and this can catch like turtles and big fish and shark. And so they did some experiments to see how long those animals would last in that environment. They also used special measurement devices to figure out what colours do things we find in birds and turtle stomach reflect because we're trying to see through a turtle or a seabird's eye to see, what, to see if that might explain what the different marine animals are choosing when they mistakenly eat plastic for food. So the teachers did lots of um, fun experiments and hopefully they had a great time while they were out on those islands doing it. So what did we find? We found that there's approximately 4.1 items per metre of our coast. So in Australia we have a massive coastline and it's over 36,000 kilometres. So this equals 
around 150 million pieces of rubbish on our coastline today. And if we divide that by the number of people in Australia, we get around six and a half pieces of rubbish on our beaches for every person that's in Australia. But what we found was that 76% of this is actually plastic. The rest of it is made up of glass and metal, um, polystyrene like eskies um, and paper. But in Australia, around 76% of it is plastic. When we did our ocean surveys, the majority of what was found was also plastic. Um, you can see these dots here show you um, numbers of different items and the white crosses show you where um, cities are. So a lot was found outside of Brisbane and a lot was found outside of Sydney. But also a lot was down, found down um, off the southwestern coast of Tasmania. There's not a big population down there. So why might that be different? So I want you guys to think about that. I'll go through it a little bit later but I want you to think about that. But what we found was that there was on average about 5,000 pieces of plastic for every square kilometre of ocean water. That's around Australia. Um, and I don't know if a lot of you have heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, it's a big pile of garbage up between America and Hawaii. But its plastic density is around 335,000 pieces of plastic plastic per square kilometre. But Australia's was 5,000. So that's just to give you an idea of what the plastic density is like. So what did we find? Hopefully this will answer a couple of questions um, that came in through the email. What did we see the most? Well, on the land-based surveys, hard white plastic was what we found the most of. Um, and actually in the sea surveys, hard white plastic came up the most as well, followed by blue hard plastic, and that was both on the land and sea. The next item on the land we found the most of was brown glass. Um, and I want you guys to have a think about why the brown glass might not have been found at the sea, on the sea um, experiments. Why might brown glass not have been picked up? What's the difference between plastic and glass on the ocean? And then the next one was white polystyrene, like from Eskies. So you can see that little orange square on your screen, and that should show up at about three centimetres by three centimetres. So the majority of what we found on our beaches, so 65%, was smaller than that square. So that's really small, isn't it? But most of the time, it's very hard to see these small things. We only find the big things. But the majority of what we found on our beaches was small. So I challenge you all, next time you go to the beach, to have, really have a good look and see if you, if you find a lot of small things less than 3 by 3 centimetres. So what were the cleanest and dirtiest beaches? Well, that's a really good question. But as scientists, we don't like to use the term cleanest and dirtiest beaches because we, how do we really define cleanest and dirtiest? Is it basically the number of items found on that beach? But what about the survey area? What if one beach had a bigger area than another beach? How do you account for that? What if one beach is in a city and one beach is in the country? Should they be treated the same? What about the shape of the beach, like, like a headland or a cove? These will react differently with the way they hold marine debris, as well as the substrate and if there's backshore vegetation or not. Things might blow up onto a sandy beach and get caught in backshore vegetation, whereas if you have a beach that's rocks, you know, and the tide comes up and goes out, then the debris could get washed in and out constantly and might not sit anywhere. And so we might not find any. So we have to take that into account. We also need to look at wind. 
wind plays a major role in our marine debris. And areas that are, have offshore winds versus onshore winds. And tides and currents. Currents are a major influence of where we find marine debris. So the reason there is a Great Pacific nut garbage patch is due to currents. That's where currents circulate and they're called gyres. But it's basically a big current circulating that grabs all the rubbish and puts it into a big circle and makes it denser and denser. So we, we don't answer the question, what are the cleanest and dirtiest beaches? Because there's so much that goes into that question. What we can do, however, is have a look at all of those different factors, like the population and the shape of the beach and the substrate of the beach and the wind and tides, and we can put that all into models and have a look and go, okay, accounting for all of that, where are we most likely to see most of the rubbish? And this is what one of our models has shown us. So the red areas are where there's estimated to be most rubbish. And you can see that's over towards Perth and on the northwest coast of Hobart. If you also look at this map, you can see that Broome, Darwin and Cairns have an open circle for their populations. Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth have a grey circle and Sydney and Melbourne has a black. The reason Sydney, so Sydney and Melbourne have black circles because they have a much higher density of people than Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth, which have a higher density than Cairns, Broome and Darwin. So these are shaded because of colour. So the lighter the colour, the less the population. And what we can see, if we look at Melbourne and Sydney, we can see that it's estimated that there will be um, higher densities of rubbish over in the Sydney and Melbourne region to what there will be in the Cairns region. And that's most likely driven by the population. Because we found that on our beaches, most of the stuff we find is local. It comes from us. So it's from us going down to the beaches and dropping stuff and having parties and leaving it there or dropping stuff in this, dropping rubbish in the streets and it blowing into a drain and going out um, through the drain system and landing on the beach. Then if we go and have a look over in Perth, so Perth doesn't have a very big population like Sydney and Melbourne, but it's red. And the reason for that is because Perth gets a lot of onshore winds. So we think that over here the wind is more important to marine debris than population. And in Hobart, the northwest coast, where the little red bit is, is um, there's not much population down there at all. But again, we think that the winds are driving this, um, the winds and the current. So there's a lot more factors involved in just what's on our beaches. Um, and is it related to who's got, you know, who's got the cleanest and dirty beaches? We can see that there's lots of different things that drive what can be found on our beaches. Um, this little map shows you onshore winds. So we can see that over where Perth is, it's the darker purple. And over on the northwestern um, side of Tasmania, it's dark purple as well. So it's showing you that these have you know, large onshore winds and that's most likely what's driving this red colour on our model. So where is it likely to go? If it's on our beaches and we say it got there because well, what we found is it's mainly gotten to our beaches from us. It appears to be from Australia's population. It's not coming from other countries. So where's it going to go? Well, again, our models, and our models are of currents and tides and wind, suggest that most of it is going to stay around, particularly that on the eastern side of the country, around the Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. We see that it's going to stay around in those areas. But over on Perth, the currents are such that it actually might take our rubbish to other countries.
So one of the questions that came in was, how do we get this knowledge out there? How do we tell people about it? So one of the things we've done, and we worked with, um, you saw a slide earlier that said we'd worked with um, over 4,000 students and um, 50 classes. And so we're going out and telling and showing the kids and taking them down to the beach and showing them what it is that's out there. Because you guys, the students, you guys are going to be the next set of decision makers. And so if you guys see what's out there, you can start thinking about it and start changing the ways of things that happen even in your school. You know, if there's rubbish in your school and you live near the beach, you might go and pick up all that rubbish and put it in the bin so you know it doesn't end up on the beach. Lots of other things we've been doing is we've done some television shows. Um, hopefully some of you have seen the Scope episode or the Behind the News. We've also had a video on Catalyst and we've been on the project. As we travelled around the country and did our surveying, we were often on local radio and in local newspapers. We also have a Facebook page for Marine Debris um, and we have some articles that have been out in newspapers and things like that. So we're trying to get what we've found and what we've done out into the public to say, hey, you know, what we've found is most of the debris is local, it comes from us, and so what we need to do is change the way we behave. So rather than when you go shopping, getting all your shopping in plastic bags, you take bags with you and you get all your shopping in, you know, your normal, in your normal bags, put it in your backpack and take it home. You don't need a plastic bag. To get it out in um, the scientific community, we've been writing lots of publications and lots of reports. Um, we've been in fishing magazines and um, other types of magazines. So we're really trying very hard to get this, the results of this study and the purpose of this study out there because this is the first study in this country that's looked at marine debris on national scale. We've actually gone out and said, what is out there? And before that, everyone knew it was out there, but no one actually knew what it is. And so now we can say, you know, the number one item we found on Australia's beaches was hard white plastic. And then the second one was hard blue plastic. So you know, what are hard white plastic and hard white and hard blue plastic items? You know, and have a look at how they're used. And I said at the beginning what we want to do, part of our project goal was to look at wildlife and how that interacts with, uh, and how wildlife interacts with the marine debris. So what we did, is we looked at seabirds. So there's 193 species of seabirds around the world. And so we had a look at where these seabirds live, when they're breeding and when they're not breeding. And then we put that together with where is all this plastic. So you saw that we did lots of voyages on the southern surveyor. And we created a model of where you know, marine debris is likely to be in our environment. So we can put these two together and really have a look, you know, where do the birds exist and where does the rubbish exist and where they exist together, that's what we call exposure. And what we found is that different birds have different amounts of plastic inside them. So we, we found that the seabirds do eat plastic or they do get caught up in it. Um, but different species have different amounts and we wondered why that is. And then we looked at how they forage. So forage means going out and eating. So birds forage differently and birds, seabirds are of all different sizes. And we also found that size is quite important. So smaller birds have less plastic in them and larger birds have more plastic in them. And they also 
react differently when you handle them and in their breeding ecology. So for example, when you um, when we looked at the shearwaters down on Phillip Island in Victoria, we found that if we cut open 10 birds and every bird had plastic in them. And then we had a look inside their colony and we found plastics inside their colony. And we noticed that the birds were coming back after feeding out on the water and they were feeding the plastic to their chicks. And if the chicks have got a stomach full of plastic, what can happen? Well, what can happen is they don't feel hungry anymore because their stomachs are full of plastic. But they're not getting the nutrients and things that they would need from the plastic in the same way that they would get from fish. So they don't grow as much and they get weak and eventually they die. And we found some of this happening, as I said, in Phillip Island in Victoria. But when I went over to um, Christmas Island, which is an island off the coast of Western Australia, I didn't find any plastic in the bird colonies. So the way the birds behave and forage is very different over there to what is happening over here. Now we don't really know why that is yet. You know, these are things we're still looking into. But it is different and that seems to have a very large impact on the way or the amount of plastics that we find in birds or the way the birds interact with plastics. We find that some birds only have small bits of plastic in them, but we've also found some birds that have large bits of plastic in them, like whole toothbrushes or glow sticks. So what happens to those birds? that eat the plastic? Well, for the individual bird, they can get chemicals in their muscles and tissues from the plastic breaking down in their stomachs. It also makes a disruption to their feeding because they're eating plastic. And so if they can't digest that plastic, like the chicks on Phillip Island, the plastic sits in their stomach and they think they're not hungry. And then they're using their energy, but they're not eating. And so when, what happens when you don't eat? Your muscles begin to waste and you start to starve to death. Also having lots of plastic inside you increases the energy that you have to use to go and catch fish. So for a seal, for example, if a seal has a piece is caught in a piece of net, it has to use four times more energy to go and catch one fish than it did if that little piece of net wasn't on that seal. So they have to use more energy. But if they're eating plastics, they're not getting the energy from the fish that they need to go and catch more fish. So it has a major effect on birds themselves. You can see this picture over here and there's 175 pieces of plastic in there and that was taken out of one bird. So, and you can see there that it says that's 5 to 8 percent of the total weight. So you guys can go and have a look at how much you weigh and calculate what's 5 to 8 percent of your total weight and how much plastic would that be? That would be like you know, between three and five kilos of plastic. Is plastic heavy or is it light? Most plastic is light. So to get five kilos of plastic, it's quite, you'd have to eat quite a lot of plastic. So that can have major, major effects on the birds. But it only has effects on the birds at an individual level. It also has effects on the, on the birds at the population level. So because these birds you know, are not getting the energy they need and are using extra energy, they have an increased mortality. This means that more of them die. They have lower reproduction, which means that it's harder for them to mate, find suitable mates, and then raise their young. 
and overall um, they have a much they have reduced population numbers because individuals are dying and they're not able to um, migrate around the world as easily as what they may have been because they are feeding on plastics and they don't have the energy. So they're not able to go as far and they may perish in flight. And overall that has a major impact on their population number. And when we have a major impact on population number, if we don't have you know, 100,000 birds to mate and reproduce and give us 50,000 new birds every year, if we only have 10,000 birds to mate and give us 5,000 birds per year, our populations become what we call non-viable and they actually get smaller and smaller and smaller until the bird doesn't exist anymore and this is not what we want to happen. So plastics can have a major effect on animals. Um, so do we have any questions? Thanks PJ, um, that gave us a really great insight into the current research and I know we've got a number of students out there at the moment that have, have collected data on behalf of the scientists. So it's just a good chance for everyone to see um, what they've done in terms of collecting data and also what some of the outcomes of that data, that analysis of that data has been. Um, we've got some great questions coming in, we're going to try and get through a couple of those. Um, so TJ, I thought we'd start with um, a couple of questions from Lord Aries Inlet. Um, we've got a question from Jarvis, which I think you might have already answered. But the first question that uh, Jarvis had, had asked us was, um, what's the most common form of debris you found? And Paddy also had a question, and his question was, uh, what will be done with the information you've collected? Thanks, Jordine. They are great questions. Um, and yes, Jarvis, we did answer your question. And the most common um, piece of debris that we found on our beaches was hard white plastic, um, and then followed by hard blue plastic. Um, Patty asked what will be done with this information. Well, what we're doing is we found out what's out there. Now we can go to, and we've also had a look um, which I didn't talk about today, but we've had a look at, you know, is there the same amount of rubbish on a beach that has bins next to it? That, and is that different to um, beaches that don't have bins? And so we've gathered, gathered all this information so we can go back to the government and to your local communities and inform them and say, you know, we know that this beach has lots of bins and we found a lot less rubbish and these beaches have no bins and there's a lot more rubbish there and so maybe it's as easy as just putting in bins at beaches and that might reduce what we find on our beaches. And we hope that this um, information will go in and feed into policy of the government and help the people who make decisions about our beaches and about the marine debris issue, help them make those decisions easier. Okay, the next question is from Cecilia and Cecilia was actually one of the teachers on the Phillip Island um, uh, field expedition and um, she's got a great question. Um, when we went down to Phillip Island, um, we had a number of nets that um, the people at Phillip Island had taken had removed from seals down there. So Cecilia's question to PJ is, um, how did you go with sorting out all the, the debris um, that uh, the injured seals were tangled up in? That is a great question, Cecilia. Um, as you know, there was lots and lots there. And so for those of you who don't know what we did, so down in Phillip Island, there's a ranger station there. And several times a year, the rangers go out and look at the seals that have breeding colonies in the area. So there's um, a little island called Seals Rocks, and there's another one called Lady Julia Percy Island. And the rangers go out to these islands and they have a look at the seals and they see if they're entangled in anything like plastic or uh, fishing line or net, um, trawl net. 
And what they do is they try and catch the seal and take that net off them. So what we did was we gathered all those nets and um, bits of plastic and everything and what we found was there was over 200 um, items that had caught the seals. Most of it was fishing net um, that has been used by the fishing industry down in that area. And as I said before, you know, um, this can have a devastating effect on the populations because when the seals get trapped, the same thing happens. They have to use more energy to catch their fish, but their fish isn't giving them more energy. And being all caught up and when they grow, if the pups get caught up and when they grow bigger, um, the net doesn't grow with them and it can restrict around their neck. And we find that you know the seals um, can die from being caught up in this um, net and fishing line. Um, and Cecilia, just to let you know, I've written a paper about that and hopefully that will be coming out soon. Great. Uh, we've got lots of questions from Sarah the Sea um, College in Adelaide, so we're going to pick out a couple of those. Um, just to let everyone know, all the questions that come through, um, we'll aim to actually uh, email some of the answers back, or what we'll do is we'll include some of those questions um, in a conference that we've got coming up. Um, but on to the Star of the Sea questions. Um, I've got a couple of questions, TJ. The first one was from Eddie, and Eddie's question was, uh, what causes ocean animals to die? And we've got Nick B, and Nick B's question was, how many sea animals die each year from ocean pollution? Again, another great, another couple of great questions. Uh, so, Eddie, you want to know what causes animals in the ocean to die? Well, in relation to marine debris, um, the animals can eat it or they can get entangled in it. And if they eat it, um, several things can happen. One is that they can choke on it so they can get caught. So, for example, if a turtle's eating a plastic bag, it can get caught in its throat um, and they can choke and die. Um, they can, like the seabirds, they might be able to get it down their throat and it sits in their stomach um, and they feel full all the time and so they don't eat their fish um, and then they starve to death. Um, and they can also get entangled in it, like I talked about the seals. They can get caught up in it and then they need to use more energy to swim through the water. So they're using more energy and not getting their energy back. So again, they starve to death or it can you know, um, get caught around their fins or around their neck. And as they grow, uh, the rope stays the same and restricts. And so they often have really severe injuries um, they can be choked by the um, net or whatever it is around their um, necks or they can have flippers and fins cut off from um, the different types of rope. So the other question was how many animals you know, are, are killed um, each year in the ocean or by ocean pollution? Well, again, in relation to marine debris, there's been estimates that around a million seabirds and over a hundred thousand marine mammals are killed by plastic each year. So we know that marine debris consists of more than plastic, but this is just what's estimated that is killed by plastic alone. So this is a huge problem. And it's not just existing in other places in the world, it exists right here in Australia. Thanks, TJ. Um, our next question is from Jody. And uh, Jody had a question just regarding uh, one of the slides earlier. And Jody's asked um, the question, the 65% found less than three centimetres squared, is this per number or weight or both? No, yeah, Jody, that's a great question. So this is basically by number. So what we did is when we sampled, for every, uh, we sampled in two different ways. Um, but for every transect that we did, we wanted to know a size of the rubbish that was on there. So we broke up, so if our beach was 30 metres, we broke it up into 10 equal parts, so that's 3 metres each. 
and we took the first item found in every one of those 10 sections and recorded a size class on that. We had six size classes and those size classes were one centimetre by one centimetre, two by two, three by three, four by four, five by five and larger than that. So uh, as you can see in this photo that you've got up on your screen now, right at the bottom there's a thong. So the thong would be in size six because it's really big. Um, a cigarette butt would go into something around a size two. Um, so we took a random sample of everything we, or not a random sample, sorry, a stratified sample of size of everything we found. And, and that stratified sample come back and said, yes, yeah, 65% of what we found and what we did size classes on was less than three by three centimetres. We haven't done anything with weights. Um, we've just basically done it on numbers, colours, sizes, um, and what it was made of. Terrific. Um, we've got a question from Ike from Camden Haven Pie. And uh, Ike's question was, how many different species consume black feet? Well, Ike, that's a great question. Um, and that's a really hard question to answer because we don't know. We really don't know. Um, we do know that there are certain species that eat plastic or get caught in plastic. But, you know, do we really know how many fish species are out there? And, you know, we don't have time to go out and catch, you know, 20 different types of every different types of fish to see if they've got plastic in them as well. So we can't actually answer that question. But what we can say is that to date, um, over 600 species or marine species have been studied um, and are known to be impacted by marine debris. Um, but my gut feeling is that there is a lot more. Um, but we found plastic in everything from um, plankton. So plankton is the little microorganisms um, that you can't see kind of with your eye. You need to look at a microscope. Um, so we found plastics that you can't actually see um, with your eye. Um, in the plankton right up to animals such as seals and things like that. Um, so it goes all the way through the food chain. It's not just in small, um, in small species and it's not just in big species. It goes all the way through. But we don't know, we really don't know how many species are affected at this stage. Great. Now we've had a lot of questions from Tim Gabby Primary School. And um, so we've got a couple of questions here that they'd like to ask you, DJ. Um, the first one, which I think you may have answered, is um, what type of plastic is found the most on the beaches? And the second question was, how are you going to make people more aware about the problem of marine debris? The, again, they are great questions. Um, yes, the type of plastic that we found the most on the beaches was the white hard plastic followed by the blue hard plastic. And how do we make people aware? Well, you saw, um, there were, I had a couple of slides in there um, where we've done TV interviews and radio interviews and we've put out stories in magazines and in newspapers. Um, so this is how we're trying to get it out into the general public and we're also writing reports and scientific papers to get it out there in the scientific community. And we hope, and we've also, one of the major ways we've got it out into the community is going around and talking to all the school kids, um, the students and other community groups about marine debris, um, how it gets there, what's there and what can be done about it. Um, so these are the ways we get it out there and hopefully you guys listening to this today will go home and talk to your parents and your siblings and your friends and maybe think of ways that you can reduce waste or plastics in your school grounds because what's in your school grounds will have an impact on your beaches and you don't even need to live near a beach to have an impact on a beach because anything that goes down a drain generally goes into a river and, all, and the rivers generally go out into the beaches so it may end up on our beaches. So even if you live inland, keeping your 
schoolyard clean is very important to the beaches that we have around Australia. So we can all take responsibility and we can all do something um, to help clean up the problem. Thanks TJ. I think that's about all the time we've got to go through questions today. We've just had some fantastic questions and just letting everybody know that we'll actually keep a record of those and we'll either get back to you via email or we'll actually include your questions um, in the online conference because there's been some great questions there and it would be great uh, for them to be answered. Um, so I'd like to say a big thanks to CJ for presenting the work that the CSIRO team have been doing and also thanks to everyone who's joined the webinar today. Um, just to let you know that the webinar is being recorded, so if TJ said something today and you want to go back and have a look at some of the facts or figures, you'll be able to do that by just going on to our website. Um, so the other thing is just to let you know that we've actually got an online conference coming up and that's on the 11th of June. And um, what we're going to do on that day is we're actually going to showcase everybody that has been involved in the program. So today we've, we've, um, we've looked at the work that the scientists have been doing, but at the online conference we're actually going to have um, some stories and some information from schools, uh, educators, also from the scientists and also from some corporate groups. Um, we're going to find out a little bit about what they've been doing in their local community. So it's definitely worthwhile um, logging on on that day to find out a little bit more about that. Um, as I said, it will be on uh, just after World Oceans Day. So uh, we're celebrating it on the 11th of June, so keep that in your diary. Um, I'd like to say thanks again for everyone um, for logging in today and joining us for the webinar. And a big thanks to everyone for participating today. And we look forward to having you all back online again on the 11th of June. Thanks again.